my name is Tom and I'm Ellie and you're watching OBC at home you know I can't quite believe it's our fourth episode already I know it's amazing how popular uh, it has become we're so grateful to everyone who's been watching each fortnight and especially those who've been sharing each episode with their family and friends we hope you've all had as much fun watching it as we've had making it absolutely uh, now look we had hoped to be outside to bring you this show from our garden today uh, but unfortunately due to some noise from some building work nearby we're back here indoors in our studio once again studio you mean on our sofa in our living room well yeah but yeah well, well look it's not like we have a big budget for this high quality entertainment show is it uh, did you know these are just stuck on with blue tack? Did you know that? Do you know, for a show with nearly 600 views on YouTube, we really are underfunded. I agree. You know, it's not easy being a professional TV show host in such difficult circumstances. You're right, it isn't. And you know, in fact, we're going to begin the show by joining someone who thinks they might be able to do it better than us. Uh, in each episode, we have been taken on a journey of discovery with the gentle giant giant to you, uh, that is Nigel Swan, as he's explored the world of Pilates, gardening and cooking. That's right, but as Tom says, this week Nigel has decided to turn his hand to something only a select few will ever truly master. Mm, like you and I? Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. This is What's New with Nigel. Welcome to What's New with Nigel. I'm pretty excited about this week's episode because I'm going to be trying my hand at TV hosting. Yes, I've been watching the real experts and the legends of their field, the Richards and Judys, the Hollies and Phils, the Tom and Ellies. And I think I'd like to give it a bit of a go to see, just see what happens behind the scenes. And of course, I'm sitting on a sofa because that's what they do, and it's jolly comfortable too. But this just isn't any ordinary sofa. No, this is Tom and Ellie's sofa. <laughs> yes, and I can feel the aura, the, the adrenaline, the, the real pads that's going on when I'm sitting in this sofa. But I can hear you say, what are you doing sitting on Tom and Ellie's sofa? Surely that isn't part of the lockdown rules. Well, I've gone with my basic instincts here and decided that as a TV host, this is the place that I need to be. So I've got all of the bits and pieces that I need. I've got my iPad there with the, uh, with the logo on the back. I've bought my, uh, my own cushion, very nice cushion, uh, made and designed by Gareth Carter. So that's, uh, that's there. Can we see that? And we're, we're sort of ready to go, aren't we? But you might be wondering, well, where are Tom and Ellie? Because surely this is their sofa. Well, I'm going to let you into a little secret. Tom has just had an anonymous tip-off that somebody has gone into church and moved every single chair three centimetres to the right. <laughs> well, you can imagine. He's dashed out the house with his ruler in his hand to make sure that they're back in the right place. So I think I've got a good couple of hours before he comes back home again. So let's see what we can do. So let's get started, shall we? The first thing we need to make sure that we have for a successful show is a really good running order. And I've got my iPad here, which gives me all of the information about what we're going to be doing. And boy, it's going to be an exciting show. Now, not everything, unfortunately, has gone according to plan. I had hoped that we'd have Luke doing one of his quizzes today, but unfortunately, today is the day that he has his shave. It happens once a month, so uh, just bad luck, really. But what else have we got? Well, we're going to have a really good in-depth conversation with one of the key frontline workers here at Obi Baptist Church. That's something I'm looking forward to very much indeed. But... Um, 
but actually this sofa though, isn't, isn't that comfortable. Um, you can always tell about the owners of a, of a settee and a sofa, can't you? By what's pushed down the, the cracks at the back. Should we have a, should we have a quick look? See what's down there. See butternut squash doll here anywhere. Anyway, let's get on with the show and let's go for a real good in depth interview. I hope you'll enjoy this. Hi, well, now many of you will know Paul Neville. Um, he has many roles within our church, including being church secretary, and he also participates in most of our Sunday morning services, uh, sometimes with his dog in the in the background. Um, and he expertly guides us through the events happening at church. And after the initial schoolboy error of forgetting to unmute his uh, mic in an early service, uh, he's been giving some really solid performances out of uh, out of Stoughton. Welcome, Paul. Uh, welcome, Nigel. Yeah, thanks for joining us. And uh, as I've said, uh, you carry out many roles within the church. But today, uh, I really just want to focus on one, perhaps uh, the most important in these uh, uh, lockdown periods of time, uh, and that's being the uh, the organiser of the Locking Up Road to a Church. Now, I, I would imagine that in these times of lockdown, th this this must be quite an arduous task for you. It must uh, it must cause you a lot of stress and strain. And I know if it was me, it would. Well, I would have problems sleeping at night. So do 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 you, do you struggle? Well, no, not not really. Uh, well, as you know, what we've been doing in this series is focusing on people within the church who during this coronavirus have really been frontline workers. You know, we've talked to educationists, to uh, paramedics, to, to local councillors. And well, I, I just feel that um, within the role of, of, of having to really manage a, a dispersed congregation, uh, you are very much as part of the Locking Up Rota, um, one of our frontline workers. Do you? Would you agree? Well, no. I mean, the fact that we're not meeting there, yeah, it's impacted, but nobody's got to actually lock up. Or yeah, but I know. I, I think obviously it, it, it's that sense of of keeping the social distancing, making sure that uh, you know you, you're not dashing for the for the exit, and and, and keeping all of that distance. I, I would imagine this is a real strain for you. No, no. I mean, I, I don't know what you're going on about. I mean, the, these questions. I mean, I, I just don't know what you're talking about. Why, why don't you leave it to the professionals to do the questions? It's, it's obvious that the church wrote and isn't needed at this time. So, so th th sorry. So th let me just get this straight then. What you're saying is during this lockdown process. Yeah. The fact that we're not meeting at church means you don't have to lock up afterwards no no nobody has to unlock nobody has to lock up nothing well 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 i wish you'd told me that earlier i could have got somebody else to interview well i wish you'd tell me earlier what you wanted to talk about look i've got stuff to do here julia's up to her knees in guinea pig poo i've got to go and blow it out her so let me just get this straight all you actually do on a Sunday morning is sit there with your headphones on, telling us how good the weather in Stoughton is and how the traffic on Saw Valley Way is less than it usually is. Is that all you do? <sighs> this is a total waste of time. I'm off. Goodbye. Don't, don't you walk. Don't you walk. Away, don't you walk away from me. And by the way, we all think Martin Jones is a far better church secretary than you. Honestly. Yes, well, perhaps it's uh, not as easy as it looks. <laughs> Thank you, Paul, for agreeing to be interviewed. <clears throat> so, uh, I wonder what else is left on the uh, running order. Um, I'm beginning to worry that this might not be for me. After all, I did break the internet only last Sunday during my preaching and, uh, well, Perhaps this isn't my forte, <laughs> unlike Pilates and 
map making and food making. So uh, I think I better get off uh, before Tom <laughs> comes back wielding his <laughs> ruler. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of uh, What's New with Nigel and uh, do let me know what uh, what things you'd like to, me to try over the coming weeks and uh, we'll see what uh, what we can do. Uh, I think actually I can I can hear the front door opening so I'd better be off fairly quickly. Bye. See, it isn't always easy being a TV host, is it, Nigel? Uh, for professionals, you know, Richard and Judy, Philip and Holly, Ellie and I, uh, well, it takes years of practice to become as good as we are. You, know, you might say we're just naturals at it. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a gift. It's a, sorry, what was that? You want me to, you want me to get on with the show? Sorry, my, that's my producer wants me to. <laughs> to get on with the show. Uh, that's what's new with Nigel this week. Don't forget, if you've got any ideas for what you'd like to see him turn his hand to in the future, um, then do get in touch with us at the email address on the screen, obc at home at odbbaptist.church. Uh, and Paul, if you are watching, um, don't listen to him. Um, you're a much closer second best than he made it made it out to be. Um, now moving on quickly, um, uh, we're actually going to go back in time as we introduce the next show in our Paradox Through the Years series. Each fortnight, along with uh, a new episode of OBC at Home, we've also been releasing a performance from our very own Paradox Performing Arts Group from years gone by. This week, it's the turn of All Things Are Possible, performed on the 1st of December 2001. I was 10 years old, uh, Nigel would have been older, um, uh, but here he is, along with some other faces, young and old, that you might recognise from within the OBC family. Here's some clips from All Things Are Possible. Oh, you can stand up all by yourself. You can stand up alone. You need the touch of the mighty hand. You can stand up alone. So that was a few short clips from All Things Are Possible, which, as Tom said, was recorded on December the 1st, 2001. I was eight, by the way. Yeah, not that long ago then. Sorry. Um, as always, the full performance will be released tonight over on our YouTube channel at 7pm. Uh, so just head over to the YouTube website, search for Obi Baptist Church, uh, or you can visit our website, www.obibaptist.com. Dot church where you'll find some of our other videos with links direct to our channel. Thanks again to Andy Bennett for all of his hard work in producing these performances and their trailers in digital format for us. Now we've said before that one of the great things about Paradox is that they are still performing sketches for us today. A few weeks ago we showed Gillian Mason performing an adaptation of a classic Victoria Wood sketch, Kimberly. Well today she's back with another. So sit back relax and enjoy a guided tour around a very special location with your tour guide, Natalie. This is Bronte Burgers. Oh, hello and welcome. My name's Natalie and I'm going to be your official guide this morning. Now, before we begin the tour around the house, I'd just like to go over a few details as, as we like to term them. Um, well, as you can see, we're standing in the hallway of the Great Haworth Parsonage. Now, this is where the Haworth Parson, the Reverend Bronte, used to live. Yes, he lived right here with his daughters, the famous Bronte sisters. 
sadly, they're no longer with us, but they have left us their novels, which I haven't read, uh, being more of an Agatha Christie fan, actually, but let's not talk about that. Um, well, I think we're ready to start the tour now, so if you want to pass by me, my me feet, because I've got bunions, and move down the corridor to the parlour. <clears throat> Is everybody here? Come on in! Yeah, okay, that's great. Well, as I said, this was a room that in those days was known as a parlour, which is something similar to our lounge type sitting room affair in modern terminology. Unfortunately, the wallpaper is not original to the period to which we are referring to, although I do feel it gives you a sense of what life must have been like in those blustery old Yorkshire days of long, long ago. Hmm. Well, the portrait over there on the wall is actually of Charlotte Bronte, one of the famous Bronte sisters. Now, I know you're thinking that she probably looks a bit gloomy to us, but had she been alive now, she probably would have had a perm, worn some lippy, had a nose piercing or two, or maybe just taken some drugs to maintain a more cheerful attitude. Who knows? Well, if you want to utch on past me and we'll go down the corridor into the Reverend Bronte's study. Okay, right. Come on in, come on, come on. Is everybody there then? Yeah? Oh, lovely, lovely. We're getting to know one another really well today, aren't we? This is smashing. Well, as I said, this was his study and it is a typical study in which to do studying because you can see we've got a desk and a chair. Oh, and there's my tank top. I've been looking for it all over. Oh, what am I like? Anyway, yeah, this was his study. And I like to imagine this elderly old gentleman of an evening hunched over his desk, writing his sermon and maybe thinking to himself, Oh, where's me cocoa got to? I bet those daughters of mine are writing another chapter in their books rather than looking after their old dad. Or something like that he might have been thinking. We just can't be sure. We don't know. But, you know, it was a long time ago. Yeah, and that's something I really need to point out to you, is this is a really exposed part of the United Kingdom. I mean, it's May now, and I'm still having to put my Liberty bodies and my fleecy thermal vest on of a morning. Hmm, yeah. Well, over on the desk, we can see a pair of the Reverend's gloves, and they tell us such a lot about him. First of all, he had two hands, and secondly, he wasn't missing any fingers. Oh no, yes, quite smart really. Um, and we think that maybe they were knitted by one of the famous Bronte sisters, but we're not quite sure. I'm fairly confident that their brother Branwell didn't knit them because after all, he was a bit of an alcoholic and I'm sure he couldn't even cast on, <laughs> no. no. Anyway. Let's not talk any more about that. If you file past me, we'll go on up the stairs. Uh, yeah, hutch on up there, yeah. And then when you get to the landing, just stop. Right, okay. Right, well, if you look out at the window, over the graves to the hills in the distance, I'm fairly confident that you can hear the wind wuthering. Now, there's a good old Yorkshire word, wuthering. And some other Yorkshire words are parking and fettle. Mm, great. Well, anyway, let's carry on down the corridor and go to the room at the end. Okay. Right. Come on in, everybody. Come on, come on. And don't bite, I promise. <laughs> well, not yet, I don't. Anyway, the room in which we are now standing in was originally Charlotte's mother's bedroom and she used to brush her hair of a morning in here. And then after her, it was Charlotte's bedroom. And she also used to sit here and brush her hair. And you can see over on that little dressing table, there's a hairbrush that we think may actually have been like the one that Charlotte used to brush her hair. Um, just ignore the Claire's accessory label that's attached to it. <laughs> anyway, 
in the glass cabinet over there, you can see something that we refer to as a day dress. Now this was a dress that was worn during the day and not at night. We believe it may have belonged to Anne or Emily and I am fairly confident this time that it couldn't possibly have been Bramwell's. Well, not unless he had even more problems than history is prepared to tell us. Hmm, <laughs> yes. Well, oh yes, and a few dates for those date-minded amongst you. It is known that the Brontes moved here sometime during the 19th century, and they stayed here for quite a number of years. Hmm, that's nice, isn't it? Anyway, as I said, Charlotte had this as her bedroom and she used to sit here during the day, I would imagine. And over there you can see a pair of slippers, which possibly could have been like the ones that Charlotte wore. And I like to think of her sitting in this bedroom, wearing those slippers and brushing her hair. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? Well, we've only got one more room to visit, so if you want to carry on down the corridor, yeah, move me moped out of the way, it doesn't matter. Okay, come on in, come on in everybody, come on, come on, right up here, then you can have a good view. Right, well, at one time, this was Branwell's room, and I think people tend to forget that he was quite artistic in his own way. Yeah, of course he was lazy and conceited, and a bit of a dipsomaniac, well, then I suppose if he'd lived today, he'd probably be a member of government, wouldn't he? <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, well, for those of you who would like to take a souvenir home, as a souvenir of your visit this morning, please do visit our gift shop. We've got an absolutely fantastic array of gifts there. Anything you could imagine, ranging from Bronte video games, Bronte body warmers, Bronte toilet roll holders, Bronte novelty tea strainers, Bronte feminine deodorants, you name it, we've got it. And there are like refreshments and snacks being served in the Heathcliff Nosher Bar next door. So please feel free to sample one of our popular Bronte burgers or for the more fibre conscious amongst you, why not try a Branwell Bronte burger? Well, it, oh, oh yes, there's just a last little message for those of you who are on the Yorkshire Heritage Cultural Coach Trip. Please can you reconvene in the car park at 2pm for this afternoon's trip, which I do believe is a visit to three dark satanic mills, Emmerdale and Nora Batty's front room. Well, all it remains is for me to say thank you ever so much for being such a lovely group. I hope you've enjoyed our visit and I hope you'll come back to see us again in the future. Bye! So that was Gillian Mason performing the Victoria Woods monologue, Bronte Burgers. I hope for you at home that was an educational tour around the Howarth Parsonage and full of opportunities to learn more about the Bronte sisters, even if some of the information might not have been entirely accurate. Still, a big thank you to Jill for preparing that sketch for us. Now, we're going to stay in the theme of education as we turn our attention now to hear from one of our own church members sharing her experience of working within a school during this lockdown period. As we know, the government are encouraging schools to reopen to certain age groups and it seems there's some confusion and doubt over how that's going to work. But of course, we mustn't forget that a number of teachers, support staff and other educational staff have continued to work in schools throughout this whole period of lockdown to provide a safe space for those children of key workers to be and to continue their learning during school hours. One of those who has continued working for most of this period is Rosie Neville. So we sent Tom to go and meet with her to find out more about the challenges that schools are facing as more children are encouraged to return to schools in the coming days and weeks. I hope you're watching, Nigel. You might learn something about interviewing. Well, hi there, Rosie. It's uh, great to have you with us here on OBC at Home. Thank you uh, for joining us. Obviously, lots of people uh, in our church family will know a little bit about you and a bit about your uh, role and the kind of the context you're working in but perhaps for those who don't uh, know much about you and, and, and that, that context could you just share 
with us a little bit about who you are and what your role is in education. Yeah, okay. So as you say, my name's Rosie and I work at Holy Cross Catholic Primary School, which is a beautiful Catholic community on the edge of Ayres Montsor estate, overlooking Saffron Lane estate. And a lot of our children are from Saffron Lane estate. Um, and that's an area of significant deprivation. In the indices of deprivation, I think it's something like the 200th most deprived area out of 33,000 in, in, in the UK. So I work in Holy Cross Catholic Primary and I am the pupil wellbeing lead. And so I am all things wellbeing for the children and families. Fantastic. So a difficult context, a, quite an interesting context to work in, uh, no doubt. Um, what, what's kind of, I guess, what, what would your usual day look like before lockdown? Okay, so a usual day would be uh, we like to welcome all of our children and families into school. So a usual day would start um, with being on the gate, welcoming the children in, noticing if any of them don't seem okay for any reason, being there for any parents that might want to have a chat. And so the first part of the day is just checking in with children and families. Mm. Um, and then a big part of my role is working with the um, the children with social, emotional and mental health difficulties. So uh, I affectionately refer to them as our chair chuckers and our effers and jeffers. So um, I sometimes would be doing some direct work with the children, sometimes talking to, to the staff about strategies we can try, um, generally just supporting with children who struggle a little bit with maintaining appropriate behaviour. Um, and then also I'm the um, designated safeguarding lead. So a lot of my work is around safeguarding. So um, working with colleagues at Children's Social Care, um, working um, actually with parents, working with local family support workers and generally looking after and, and promoting safeguarding in school. Mm, wow. So some, some challenges, I'm sure, in in a normal day, uh, I'm sure only made worse to some extent by uh, the current circumstances of lockdown. Obviously, we heard from uh, Chris Swan here at OBC at, at home a few weeks ago on uh, kind of her role from a governance perspective in education. Mm -hmm. um, what's it been like for you in, in I guess, in, in a sense, on the ground in education? How has your role kind of changed? What are the new challenges that have come up uh, over the last couple of months since lockdown began? I think it's, um completely changed i mean obviously a school with only a few children in it <laughs> is not a school and so um it, my role in safeguarding has been completely different so mm -hmm. instead of just seeing the children or the families on a day-to-day -day basis a lot of the i spend a lot of time now on the phone um and so a lot of my day is spent just um being a listening ear to families making sure that, they've, that they're okay. Often from speaking to families on the phone, it might be that we realize that they might need um, maybe food banks. So we might go and pick up food from food bank and take food parcels. Um, we might visit families if they have got a problem with their internet and they can't access Seesaw Learning. Mm -hmm. We might be taking work packs to families. If we haven't heard from a family for some reason, either through the um, interactive lessons that the teachers are doing or through phoning, then we might go and do a home visit, check in and make sure everything's OK. So a lot of my day is now spent on the phone, uh, as I say, mainly being a listening ear, but also offering any practical help and support that we can offer. So it, it's it's completely different at the moment. Sure. And, and, and what other kind of the major challenges of that. Obviously, um, we, we're all, uh, any anyone in a sort of caring environment, it, it, not being able to be face to face in itself is is a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. Not being able to care in, in, in that way uh, physically. Um, ha have there been similar challenges for you or perhaps other challenges in, in your role? I think the biggest challenge from the start was um, that we needed to, um, invite our uh, uh, children whose parents are key workers or our vulnerable families. I don't like calling our families vulnerable families. I don't I think it, uh, but, but anyway, they, they are referred to as our vulnerable families. And so um, we were supposed to offer places to these families, but when 
we are also supposed to keep it to 10% of our school numbers. And that just, the maths didn't work. And so we had, um, you know, sort of 20 or so children coming in from the very start. But that meant that there was an awful lot of children and families who we knew were struggling with all sorts of issues around mental health or maybe domestic violence. And we, we knew that they ideally should be in school, but there just wasn't the capacity to have them in school. So we were supporting them remotely. Um, and then once we'd kind of got into a routine of the families that we were, we were going to phone and call the the biggest issue was um, the free school meal vouchers at first and yeah. trying to make sure that every family received their free school meal shopping vouchers. And for some reason, the government thought that in an area of deprivation, a good supermarket to suggest would be Waitrose. That was interesting. And Marks and Spencers was another one. Um, and so we were sort of trying to make sure that we got each family their vouchers. And if you're a family where you maybe don't get access to the internet or where um, you don't even necessarily have a mobile phone, that, is, that was impossible. And so, again, a lot of home visits to families where mm -hmm. we'd actually have to take vouchers to them for them to use for their shopping or take often take food parcels as well um, while we were overcoming some of the technical hitches so that was a big thing initially getting everybody to make sure they got their free school meals but also as the crisis has moved on and on it has been uh, mental health and it has been talking to families that have got no garden nowhere to take the children out where financially maybe they were either doing casual work or where they were on zero hour contracts mm. where they have found themselves in absolutely financial mm. dire straits and that has been um that has been an ongoing issue and families just really really struggling to, to cope initially it was kind of like the, the honeymoon period if you like and then um, more and more families when we phone them to check in and see how they're doing and it's clear that things are really difficult so we've been inviting more and more children to take places at school and so I should say that, that the biggest challenge is making sure that families have got everything they need practically um, but also just supporting families where if your mental well-being is, is, isn't too good anyway and then on top of that we've had this crisis it's been quite difficult for some of our families yeah yeah sure you, you you've talked before rosie uh, within our church family context um a little bit uh, i guess about some of the things you're touching on there where your role is not limited to the to the walls of the school the school gates but actually it extends into the the whole of that community and particularly as you said before overlooking the saffron lane estate mm. this area of deprivation not too far from us here yeah. uh, in odeby um yeah Tell us a little bit more about your kind of heart for that whole community, um, not just through your role, but actually for, for seeing, I guess, for seeing God move and, and, mm. and do stuff in that area. Um, certainly looking ahead, looking after mm. lockdown, kind of what your, your passion is to see happen there. Well, I think um, Saffron Lane, I, oh, I just love it. And I love the children and the families. And I deliberately will go to the post office there and, and and I Saffron Lane is beautiful and the people are beautiful and I find it so hard that there's no church on Saffron Lane and I look at that estate and I just see the the beautiful children and families on that estate and I'm like where's the church there isn't a church on Saffron Lane and I look and there are some really, really good projects. So there's the Gold Hill uh, play, uh, play Adventure Playground. They do amazing work in that community. Mm -hmm. uh, they offer a safe place for children to go after school and at weekends. They do food bank from there. They do the uh, fair share and community fridge and it's amazing. And then also the Saffron Lane Community Resource Centre. That's great. You can signpost families who are struggling with either with debt or with benefit difficulties or housing difficulties, and we can signpost them. And it's like there's things there that address the, 
the financial poverty, if you like. Mm -hmm. But what about the spiritual poverty? It's who is who's preaching the gospel, who's telling those families that there's a God that loves them. There's who's giving them a safe place where they can go and they can just experience unconditional love and where they can hear the gospel. And so my heart is for a church plant in the heart of Saffron Lane. And that is something that has been building and building and building. Um, and yeah, that's my hope that at Holy Cross, we're so blessed because we're a, a Catholic school. And so the families kind of, when they come to us or, or in assembly, our children, they hear the gospel, they, they're taught to pray, they talk to God, they understand that there's a God that loves them. And it's, it's, it's wonderful. But I walk around the streets of Saffron Lane when I'm out and about on my deliveries and I see that, that there's such a need and such a, a spiritual poverty and there isn't a church and I find that so hard. Mm, that's a wonderful, wonderful passion and heart to have. I mean, it, obviously a sad circumstance that there isn't that, that spiritual input, but, but what a, you know, what a prayer to have really to, to look ahead and say, come the end of this, you know, that's something you really want to see uh, develop. Obviously we, we can be praying for that. Are there other things in particular that you'd like us to be praying for um, over the coming weeks and months? I think the two things that I always sort of seem to hold on to in my um, in, in my prayer time, the two things is always so Holy Cross. It's it's just such a, a, a beautiful school community and just for protection on the children and the families, especially as the school is opening up more and more. We just pray that everybody stays well um, and just for um, wisdom to just, you know, keep moving forward as a school. And then for the for the church plant that just people will, I don't know, that if that's a, I have this sense that God's already doing stuff on the staff. And it's not about somebody taking something. It's not like somebody is to go and take a, uh, take a seed, if you like, with the, and plant the seed of the gospel, but then to take their own soil and to take their own plant pot. It's not that. It's God's already doing stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's about people that will meet together to sort of say come on then god what are you doing what are you doing on the staff and how can we just get alongside and and, and do whatever it is that god wants to do on the staff so it's just for wisdom to know what a church plant on the saffron lane would look like and what it would be great Thanks, Rosie. We'll certainly uh, be encouraging uh, everyone who's watching uh, to be including you and the school and the community in their prayers, not just at the moment, as you look towards uh, hopefully the end of lockdown and the, the kind of logistical challenges that that's going to bring you and, and, and the wider school, um, but, but actually looking into the future um, to, to, for you to find ways to get on board with what God is doing. So and that's really encouraging. Uh, thank you, Rosie, for, for sharing with us. Thank you for joining us. It's been great to, uh, to chat with you. Uh, and I'm sure we're going to hear more exciting things coming out of your context and your community uh, in the, the months and the years ahead. Thanks, Rosie. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rosie, for uh, meeting with me and for sharing your experiences of lockdown in your school context, uh, but also for sharing your passion for uh, seeing God at work in the whole of the community that your school serves. Uh, I do encourage all of you at home to be praying uh, for all those who work in the education sector, as many of them do indeed return to work this coming week, uh, if they haven't already been working throughout this period of lockdown. As Rosie requested, do pray particularly uh, for protection for the staff and the children at Holy Cross, and of course the schools up and down our country. And do pray for wisdom for Rosie in particular, as she considers how best to bring God's love into the whole community that she works within. Absolutely. Thank you, Rosie. Now, coming up next is a feature that seems to be increasing in popularity with every episode. That's right. It seems his fame is beginning to rival even that of Nigel himself. Uh, it might be because it's the only time we ever see him wearing a smart shirt. Um, maybe it's because of his slightly obsessive passion and enthusiasm uh, for game shows on TV. 
Either way, he's taking the game show world by storm. He's the one and only Luke Wigson, and he's back to host another episode of the Quarantine Quiz Show. My advice to you all, say what you see. Enjoy. Hi and welcome to the Quarantine Quiz Show with me, your host, Luke Wigston. Today we're playing catchphrase. Let's find out who our contestants are this week. Hi and welcome to the Quarantine Quiz Show. What's your name, where you're from and what's your buzzer for today's show? Hi Luke, my name's Elaine. I am Old Obi family and uh, my buzzer is my cat's toy, which is a flamingo and I have a buzzer bell, which isn't working. <laughs> Great, welcome to the show, Elaine. Hi, I'm Princess. Uh, I'm originally from Nigeria uh, and I have two buzzers a table tennis bat and a little bell. Brilliant, welcome to the show, Princess. Hi, Luke. I'm Richard. I'm from Oadby and my buzzer is this little tambourine. Well, it's great to have you on the show, Richard. Great to be here, Luke. Thank you. Our contestants will guess at the catchphrases, and if they get it right, they get a point, and they also move on to the bonus round. And if they get the bonus round right, then they get three points. Let's play catchphrase. Let's see what our first catchphrase is. What is this? Princess. Waving goodbye. Waving goodbye. It's not quite waving goodbye. Elaine's in there. Mexican wave. Mexican wave. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> well done, Elaine. Unlucky Princess Richard's in there just as well. So let's see what our first bonus round is for Elaine. Elaine, press your buzzer and one of these blocks will disappear. What do you think that is? Writing on the wall. Writing on the wall. I'm afraid it's not writing on the wall and one guess per round. So let's go back to the main catchphrases. I think Richard just got in there just first. Is that green fingers? Green fingers. Of course it is, Richard. Well done. So Richard, when you're ready, press your buzzer and one of these black squares will disappear. What do you think it is? Throwing straws? Oh, unfortunately, I can't give you that one, Richard, I'm afraid. But I think Elaine knows what it's going to be. Let's move on back to our main catchphrases. Oh, that was close, that was. But I think, uh, I don't know who that one was. Maybe it was Princess. Princess, what, what do you think this one is? Sweating like a dog. Sweating like a dog. That famous phrase, sweating like a dog. I'm not sure I've ever heard that before. Elaine's oh. in for the next one. Elaine, hot dog. what is it? Oh, hot dog. it's a hot dog. There we are. Well done, Elaine. Elaine's moving on to the bonus one and she thinks oh, she knows no. what it is. So, Elaine, press your buzzer and one of these black squares will disappear. Drawing the short straw. Drawing the short straw. Let's find out. Of course it is, drawing a short straw. Well done, Elaine. Our next catchphrase. Richard, what do you think it is, Richard? I think that's a traffic jam. A traffic jam. There you are, well done, of course it is. Bonus round for you, Richard. So, Richard, press your buzzer and one of these black squares will disappear. Difficult for you there, Richard. Uh, no, no idea, sorry. No, no problem. We'll move back to the main catchphrases. Princess, what do you think it is? Bear hug. Bear hug. Hold on, hold on a minute, my picture weren't up. Oh, I'm sorry, Elaine. I don't I want excuses. Traffic jam. <laughs> Princess is just a bit too quick for you there. So, Princess, this one's just for you when you're ready. 
flicking the switch? Flicking the switch. It's not flicking the switch, <laughs> I'm afraid. Back to the main catchphrases. Richard, what is that? It's a round robin. Oh. It's a round robin. Yes, it is. A round mm. robin. Well done. So when you're ready, Richard. Is that many hands make light work? Many hands make light work. Brilliant. Oh, well, well done, done Richard. Everyone's back in for our next catchphrase. This one's a tricky one. Richard thinks he knows. Is that a night owl? Is that a night owl? Yes, it is. Well Aww. done, Richard. Up to you, Richard. Okay. Driving you crazy. I don't know. It's not, I'm afraid, Richard. Back to the main catchphrases. Princess. In through one ear, out through the other. It's not exactly what I've got down, but I think I can give you it. In one yeah. ear, out the other. Move on to the bonus one for Princess. Over to you, Princess. What do you think it is? Cloud in the sky. Cloud in the sky. It's not cloud in the sky. Let's go back to our main catchphrases. Say what you see. That's Elaine. I think I heard and saw Elaine doing stuff there. Is it doing bird? Doing bird? Yeah, as in I'm, prison. I'm afraid it's not doing bird. Oh. You can't answer until somebody else gives us a wrong on. Princess? Shot in the dark here. Bird in a cage? Bird in a cage. It's not quite bird in a cage. Elaine is back in. Princess yeah. frozen out for now. Elaine? Bird cage? Not bird cage, no. Uh, Elaine frozen out. Princess back in. Princess? Bird in a cell? Bird in a cell is close, but it's not quite right. Richard, you can still have a guess. I'm just lost. <laughs> Any ideas? It's not quite bird in a cell. It's very, very similar. It's basically the same. Oh, I want to answer. Elaine? Oh. Bird cell. Not bird cell. <laughs> Frozen out. Princess. Is it stuck in a cell? Stuck in a cell? Yeah. No, it's not that. You're so close. You're all very, very close. Yes. <laughs> Cellmate. Not cellmate, no. So princess is back in, Elaine is frozen out again. So you kind of you've got a bit further away from it, but you're very close. Where is what what is it and where is it? Put those two words together. Richard, what do you think it is? I think it's a jailbird. Oh, jailbird. Yeah. Awesome. Oh well done. Well done, Richard. Oh, Over to you, Richard. Over the hills and far away. It's not, I'm afraid, it's not. Here we are for a final catchphrase. Let's see what it is. Richard, what is it? It's a bull in a china shop. It's a bull in a china oh. shop. Of course it is. Well done, Richard. Richard, when you're ready. Ready when you are. What do you think that is? I still have no idea, I'm sorry. It is, of course. That's a good one. That's a good one. Guys, the limit. There you are. Well done. And that's the end of our show today. The scores are in. We have in third place, with two points, was Princess. Oh, no. Second place, with five points, was Elaine. Which means that our winner with nine points is Richard. Well done, Yay. Richard. Well done, everybody, for today's Wait, show. Wait, shall I see you, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Thank you for joining us on the Quarantine Quiz Show.
Join us next time for more Lockdown Laughs. Thank you so much, Luke, for hosting another episode of the Quarantine Quiz Show. Uh, well done to Richard, who takes the title of Catchphrase Champion uh, this week. And commiserations, of course, to Princess and Elaine. Luke will hopefully be back next time with another instalment of the Quarantine Quiz Show. If you've got any ideas of what game show you'd like him to try out, or if you'd like to be a contestant on one of the shows, then please do get in touch with us at OBC at home at obbaptist.church. That email address should be on the screen for you to see. Uh, now, sadly, that's all we have time for today. Thanks again to everyone who has participated in our show today. And a big thank you to you at home for watching. Uh, we hope to be back in two weeks' time with another episode, but to play us out today is a father and son's band uh, with a worldwide fan base. You mean the family they've got in Romania? Oh yeah, but it still counts. It still counts. It still counts. Okay, uh, this is the Brock Band. We'll see you soon. Bye for now.
stammering tongue lies silent in